Hi everyone, thanks for coming for the talk. Um, today I'm going to talk about why should you learn writing C extensions. Um, first of all, a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Gavin. Uh, I'm a, co a principal quantitative developer in SIM Corus, uh, which is a quantitative asset management firm. Uh, we use Python for full stack in the development. Uh, we work closely with the researchers um, uh, to help them to um, facilitate their research work. Uh, we build the tools in Python for them, and also uh, for the fund management team. So that's why we are quite keen on the um, uh, the Python performance, uh, especially on the CPU band problems, because every day we use quite a lot in the uh, quantitative libraries. And um, that's what we go for um, today's agenda. And uh, first of all, um, uh, we would like to understand performance bottleneck on the CPU band problems. Uh, that is what um, we, are, we are quite keen on resolving it in our daily work. And then um, we will try to work it around by writing six extensions, introduce what it is for um, six extensions. And I will share also some of the modern tools to help writing six extensions. So the target audience is for those, um, for example, the researchers, the data scientists who used um, Python for their research work and also development uh, which involves so much on the um, uh, CPU band problems. Uh, first, uh, I, will, I will go over these examples to benchmark um, different approaches. So um, the problem here I would like to introduce is called to com the, the computations of rate of sum on labels. Um, these examples um, can be used in um, many fields. But for example, in um, the portfolio management, we use it quite often to compute the risk exposure. Uh, for example, now in the example, we have six instruments and each labels may um, represent uh, their whole coding definitions. For example, zero may represent US dollar and one may represent the um, Japanese yen, two may represent the euro dollar. And then um, if you would like to compute the uh, risk exposure for each currency, um, the way doing that is pretty straightforward in Python. Uh, first of all, we, we iterate uh, for each instrument and add up the weights on the particular labels and then return it out. The runtime capacity for the algorithm is um, is big O N. Uh, it means it depends only on the number of instruments we have. Then, if you uh, are the um, the lover of um, uh, one liners, then the least comprehension will help you to write uh, the algorithm in simply uh, by the least comprehensions. Uh, what you need to do is you just iterate for each label and then sum up the ways, uh, which is the same as the specified label. Uh, the runtime capacity for this case is uh, more complicated. Um, so it depends on the number of labels and also the uh, number of elements we have. We can improve it a little bit um, by NumPy. So um, with NumPy, we have a, a um, important feature is that, um, that NumPy in many uh, low-level API calls are written in C, and also they boost up the, the performance by the schema call, um, the broadcasting or the vectorizations. It means they run the simple operations on the list of arrays uh, in parallel. So uh, in this case, we can rewrite a little bit on the uh, one line of the list comprehensions use the dot product uh, between the vectors of the instruments ways and also on the um, uh, labels. The runtime capacity uh, is the same, uh, but the M, the number of labels, depends on the Python runtime, while uh, the um, uh, number of instruments now depends on the NumPy runtime. Uh, eventually, it's, it's a more complicated, um, or I would say it's more complex algorithm but uh, if we benchmark between the uh, Python one and the non-Py one, uh, I, I would say a little bit surprised for me that uh, the um, more complex algorithms 
uh, the NumPy one and performs better than the Python one. So um, I just arbitrarily assign um, the number of labels on a thousand of instruments that I run a thousand runs and then and then uh, I for each loop I I take time I run for some ten loops and find the median time of a thousand runs and you see uh, it's uh, for the Python one, uh, it's quite steady because it depends on the number of labels. It's always thousands, so uh, it, it's pretty straightforward for that. Uh, but for the NumPy one, um, it depends on uh, the uh, uh, the variations of m. Uh, but for more complex algorithms, uh, we still have better performance than the Python, which is in a more uh, easier, straightforward algorithms, uh, which does not make so much sense. Uh, until the point you have, for example, 120 or 50 um, labels on 1,000 instruments, then uh, the result may tie. But um, uh, in this case, we will first ask the questions, why Python is slow comparatively uh, to, um, uh, to NumPy? So first of all, Python is an interpreted language um, it means it refers to compiled source code to the bytecode. But the bytecode is not the machine bytecode, but the bytecode which is used to run in the Python virtual machines. So if you import the uh, standard library at the disk and then uh, run it on any functions, then you can see the ordering of the operations to put it in the Python virtual machine. And then you can uh, just pass through the Python virtual machine by extending the Python with C or C++ extensions. So there's, there's a session in the official Python documentations to, um, to teach you how to write uh, these extensions uh, with the C Python APIs. So the idea is you have to compile uh, the um, C extensions to a shared library so um, it's in uh, the file extension .dll in Windows or .so in Unix. Then the shared library can be imported as a Python module. The case is um, most likely you can only do it by C Python, but not in PyPy, which is the uh, just-in-time version uh, of Python. Um, actually, it looks pretty difficult uh, from the documentations. First of all, you have to um, consider a few sessions, uh, the combinations and the um, language it means. First of all, you have to compile uh, the shared library in a certain file, uh, the file name um, uh, format. You have to have the module name first, then put the dot, then you put the Python versions for some 3.5, uh, for this case means uh, 3.5, Python 3.5. Then you have to put the um, uh, the CP architecture and the uh, OS uh, that you're using. You have to also consider the uh, reference count and the ownership rules when you're writing C extensions. Uh, it means in Python, all the memory are managed by the garbage collections. And if there's no, if the object's not referenced by uh, any pointer, then um, the garbage collector will clean up the uh, the object memory. So to handle that, um, it means on the C or C++ levels, every time when the object is referenced, you have to increment the count, the reference count. Otherwise, you have to decrement the count when you release the uh, object out. And ownership rules, uh, it means uh, when you return the Python object from the C or C++ functions to the Python level, then uh, you have to specify uh, who still own the object, is entirely passed through to um to Python, or is still shared between the C and the Python level. So um, it's, it's the rules you have to uh, um handled uh when you return the object out. Uh, finally, you have to handle exceptions. Um, if there's exceptions throw out on C level, uh, and they catch it, you have to set the uh, global um uh, report or call the global functions to set strings. Uh, to specify the uh, uh, error class and also the uh, error string. But nowadays, you don't need to write it from scratch uh, to call all those C Python native API. You can use the modern tools to help you doing that, and it will be much faster to use the modern tools 
to write um, the six extensions uh, to compile to to, um, uh, to the shared libraries. So uh, first, uh, which is the classical one, uh, is called Cycled. It has been for a while. Uh, syntax like uh, the Python, the target audience are Python developers. Um, it is used by a number of libraries already. Um, SidePod, Pandas, or Scikit-Learned. And the second one, the second one is in the other world, which you have um, more on the C or C++ exposure. Uh, if you're a C++ developer, especially you are quite um, uh, experienced to the C++ 11 um, syntax or conventions, then uh, it's easy for you to write entirely on the C++ dashboard and enjoy the performance uh, on C um, uh, or C++. And then bind back to the Python level. The third one I can't say is entirely uh, writing C extensions, uh, but more on the just in time combinations uh, by LLVM. Uh, number, which is uh, I would say the writing style, and it is uh, getting much attention nowadays um, to help compile the source code uh, to machine code on the fly. Other libraries are also mentioned and recommend by others as well, uh, but I, I will not go through one by one. And um, I will not I will focus on the first three and compare them. First, uh, size on uh, the classical approach, first of all, um, uh, you don't need uh, all the source code to be uh, written in the Cypher extensions. Even do you have the file, the Python style, which is in the file extension.py, change it to PYH, and then you use Cypherize to compile it to, uh, to the share library, then you, you can still enjoy the performance gain somehow. So in, in the code example, just copy the uh, Python code, and then I just compile it, and benchmark the uh, runtime. So you can see even though you compile the native Python code in Cypherize, you can gain 10 to 30% of um, performance gain in the runtime. And um, like in my simple exam example, it would close to 30% of uh, performance gain. To achieve the C runtime, or you don't want to call the C Python API um, in the C source code, then you may need to declare the function as CPDAV or CDAV. So the difference between them is um, CDAV is a hybrid function. Uh, it is accessible in Python, but it can use or it tries to use the faster C conventions in the functions to compile it. And the CDAF is a pure C function, so it is not accessible in Python level, uh, but it will try to call all the C functions uh, back behind and it's only called by uh, CPDAF. So uh, the same case, the same algorithm, uh, I just uh, rewritten it by CPDAF. So um, I would like to share you a few points. One is, uh, first of all, if you write in CPDAF, you don't, it's not necessary for you to declare all the types. Uh, if you miss the type, you just compile it as the Python objects. Uh, but if you declare the types, then you can enjoy it, or you may enjoy it and performance gained uh, on the specified types. For example, if you declare the arrays, so um, the input of labels and arrays are the numpy label, uh, the numpy arrays. Uh, but you can declare it with um, what they call the memory field. It means every time when you try to access to the numpy array on the Python level, then uh, whether you edit it or you edit it, you have to get the good, the global interpret knock, and then write it or read it. Then after that, you release the lock. But actually, um, back in, back behind in Cyton, you can just walk through with the array by their buffer info uh, without uh, getting all those uh, global interpret log. Uh, it helps node when you iterate through a long array to um, work directly on on the uh, buffer info inside. So um, that is the case uh, if you declare. Uh, the long and the square, square brackets, and you access to the numpy array buffer input. And then within the functions, uh, you can declare the dot string, you can declare uh, the types of the variable in the functions. 
also you can uh, release the guild if the um the scope uh, uh of the of the source code or the scope does not contain any uh, uh, access to the python logic so a, a benchmark between the python functions uh python functions uh which is um siphonized which is compiled to share a library and the siphon functions are pre written it to a cpdef and compiled to share library then you can see compared to um the python native functions it has a stunning performance gain like 150 times uh faster than the python function and even though you compare to um the uh, compile functions by Cytone, uh it has around 100 times of perform of um uh, performance gained um Python 11 uh, i will not go through into it so much um uh, because it, it i would say Python 11 it may involve much on the uh, c or c plus plus um experience uh but uh, i i don't expect everyone have such experience writing the uh, native c or the c plus plus um especially the 11 source code but Python 11 is more tailored for the uh, cpp 11 which you can um, use the standard library container in cpp 11 and also use their smart pointers uh, to communicate with the python um, api so the key is if you have a piece of C source code, then you can bind it back on the Python level. First of all, you specify the function name you would like um, to declare in the Python level. Then you specify the ownership policy, the call the return value policy. So either you move the object from uh, C++ level direction to Python or the object to shared between the C and the Python level. I can declare the dot string and also an argument names for the binding function. And finally, you can specify the function overloading, uh, which means if you have uh, several implementations on the same Python functions, you can still bind into the same name. Finally, uh, number, which is uh, a rising star. Uh, rising new star doesn't mean that it's a new project. It has been started since uh, 2012, uh, but I would say in the past few years, it's gaining much attention because um, they have improved their functionality so much. Uh, a disclaimer, uh, before I did not put too much faith in the just-in-time compilations, but number, um, I would say the result uh, surprised me a lot. And um, uh, also, I also quite, like their their um the whole design and also implementation how they compiled um the bytecode uh into the machine code on the front so um uh, the how number works is first of all they convert the source code to bytecode uh the same flow as python but rather than put the bytecode to python virtual machine they just compile the bytecode the machine code by the um, C Python API on the front. So in this way, um, they, they call it the object mode. In this way, they will have better performance at least compared to the Python code. Meanwhile, they try to compile in the path uh, without any calls in the Python C API. It means they will diagnose uh, your source code, your functions to see uh, if you if um, the uh, operation can totally completely uh, pass, pass through the, um, uh, the native C API. So if they can do that, they will compile it in the code in no Python mode. Also this port the ahead of time. So um, it means you can have the C extensions compiled when the client install the library. And, uh, what is the file point, what is a good compared to the previous two libraries is they adapt the um, uh, modern, um, I would say the modern way to produce the numerical libraries, which is embrace the GPU programming. So a little bit taste uh, on the functions. So I just copy the same function from the Python and and then I put a decorated JIT and try to compile in no Python mode. 
Uh, in this way, the, um, the number will try to use the um, uh, the uh, the front end to analyze the analysis whether uh, this this function can be compiled to no Python mode. At the current stage, if it fails, it will fall back to the object mode. Also, you can declare the types for the input parameters and the return types. Uh, with this hints, it's um, uh, more likely that uh, they will compile to no Python mode. So batch mod between size on private eleven and number. So I would say the free library libraries have the roughly similar performance compared to the Python code. It will have hundred to hundred fifty times um, uh, uh, better uh, run runtime compared to the Python uh, native functions. And um, private eleven is a bit better than size on and number is likely the best case among two, but I would say the magnitude uh, difference between them compared to the magnitude difference to Python. Um, I, would, I would say I don't think it's so serious about uh, the, the, um, the statistic here that number is much better. But in general, what I serve around the internet that people uh, try to compare to those free libraries, uh, is have they're having the same conclusion that um, number is a little bit better than uh, the Python 11 or Cypher on the uh, runtime. If you have the simple functions, if a number can compile to the low Python code. So in this case, you ask, okay, it's good. Then I don't need to. Or I would say, um, uh, it seems to me that number can handle most of the cases if you compare the result. Uh, and number and somehow has the better performance in this way. Uh, you ask, okay, why do we have to you know, write an C extensions and um, uh, accept that, uh, I, and for example, number I need to compile to ahead of time compil compilations. Um, I would say, uh, in my opinion, uh, yes, if you are a researcher, if you are a data scientist, if you use Python in the interactive mode, more more the case. Um, you just put the decorator on your functions and then let the uh, number to handle it, whether it, it should compile to the no Python mode or to the object mode. In the worst case, you just fall back to object mode and um, it would just have, uh, uh, the worst cases just have a little bit better performance than Python, but uh, it would not worse than Python. But I would say if you are a um, developer, then uh, uh, I would suggest uh, this Rank C extension is still a variable asset. Uh, my perspective is if you think uh, number or cipher is better than each other, it's more likely that um, just uh, different angles have their own perspective. Um, and in, uh, I would say, in in some specific case or environment, uh, one either them will be better than the other. So for example, I just have the same function, um, which is uh, as shown in the number, and I put an assertion in the middle. And the consequence here is it can't compile to the no Python mode. So a number is good. Number can handle most of the cases, but there are still some exceptions that um, they can't handle it or they cannot compile it in no Python mode. Even though it's, it seems to be on not night a function which is simple enough to compile in no Python mode. So um, I would say compared to two libraries, um, Cython and Python 11, you have better control on which path of the code can be compiled on the C API, which path can um, be a uh, go into the uh, uh, Python API. And um, second, I would say uh, the scalability, um, if you have the number, and the scalability sometimes is concerned. Uh, they're improving so much on the uh, features, but uh, in some cases, uh, uh, they may they may um, restrict you to your, to your, um, scale up your software. For example, for the exception handling, at the current stage, they can only handle the uh, constant strength, uh, which is 
draw in the um, no Python mode. Uh, in my prefix example, if you have the exception throw out, but the string depends on, for example, the index, then you will compile to the object mode. And also, they have limited support on the object oriented design and ahead of time compilations. So it means um, if you have more code, if you uh, target to uh, migrate your piece of code, but on the class, on the class objects, on the uh, more object oriented design implementations to number, then you, know, you may have, have a hard time to that. Uh, finally, distribution. So um, for the software development, uh, if your external clients um, have uh, uncertainty of which uh, infrastructure they are using, then distribution um, is a big concern. So um, I, I would say at the current stage and uh, nowadays, uh, we're adapting uh, the latest Python more and adapting the LLVM in most of the infrastructure deployment. But uh, it's still the case for large corporates or um, in the project that the uh, the machine that they deploy may not contain the LLVM or the Python versions in the machines cannot catch up with the latest one. So um, the number I would say at the current stage, my understanding is number still requires uh, quite strictly on the versions on Python and LLVM. So, um, for example, the Py the number depends on LLVM lead requires the Python 3.6 post. Um, that means you can't deploy your software to a Python 3.5, which in the current stage is there's still a a, a, a number of groups uh, of people using Python 3.5. Exception handling on hand only available in Python 3.7, uh, which is uh, also important in some uh, in some of the softwares, which is to guarantee that they have the um, a the fraud safe uh, mechanism. The parting rules. Um, this quote is coming from one of my favorite books, uh, which is called Effective Modern C++, uh, which introduced um, a, a bunch of rules or guidelines to how to write the modern C++, and they're written by, I would say, nearly every C++ developer if you are keen to, um, uh, to use C++ in your career life. Um, there's a quote that um, if you are not interested in performance, shouldn't you be in the Python room down the hall? But um, in this quote, I would I would try to um, uh, I would incline to disagree with it uh, because in Python, uh, actually you can still have the great performance time if you handle it with uh, proper libraries, uh, if you somehow um, uh, write part of your course or critical API course um, in C extensions, uh, not necessarily all the piece of code, but you can adapt the 80-20 rule to write 20% of the core APIs in C extensions, then you can um, have a good balance between development time and the performance run time uh, in the machine. Finally, I've put all those uh, benchmark codes samples and the figures in the uh, CUNAP lookbooks. So uh, you can refer to that to see whether all the figures are shown, um, makes sense or not. Uh, I will share my presentation slide to my GitHub account. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions to my presentations, please don't hesitate to shoot me an email or send me an IM message in LinkedIn. Uh, finally, thank you so much for all your time.